welcome into church today, Willowbrook. Come on, stand your feet. This is going to be a day full of praise. God, have your way. We bless you. We thank you today, Lord. You made the starry host. You traced the mountain peaks. You paint the evening skies with wonder. The earth, it is your throne from desert to the sea. All nature testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Psalm 148 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away.
Thanksgiving week to you, church. It's going to be a great week, I hope, for you and your families this week. We have so much to be thankful for. If anybody's got something to be thankful for, can we just praise the Lord today? Come on and just pour out your praise to Him. So much. And especially because of Jesus, we have life because of Him and what He's done for us. And so it's great to gather with you this morning and just to turn our, our uh, hearts to Him and our attention to Him and to praise Him, respond to Him and worship Him today. If you're a guest, we especially want to say thank you for joining in with us today. And uh, can we just pray together right now and ask God to have His way in this place and your life specifically. Just say, God, speak to me today. I want to pour out praise and thanksgiving to you. God, we bless you. And we love you and we praise you and we believe that you're here with us. And we want to say, God, have your way today. Thank you that you sent Jesus, your son, to save us, to rescue us. And if for nothing else during this time, God, that's enough to thank you and to praise you, God, because we have life because of Jesus. That's all we need. And so, God, as your, as your children this morning, as the church gathers, we're going to just sing to you a little bit more this morning, God, and just praise you and thank you. So hear our hearts more than anything as we proclaim your name today and what you've done for us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Messiah, 
thank him today, church. Sing thank you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and 
Just lift up a hallelujah today. We praise you, Lord. Amen. Well, you can be seated, God, today. We praise you. And we're reminded just to lift our hands in complete surrender to you and in complete honor of you and all of you today, Lord. For you give us life, you sustain us. And we praise you. God, I pray that you continue to move in this place and speak through your word and through Jared today. We want to hear from you, God, so have your way. We open our hearts and our minds to what you want to speak to us, God. We praise you, we bless you, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, Willowbrook, I'm Harrison. Whether you're tuning in online or on campus, we're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. You can grab a physical bulletin or you can scan the QR code on the seat in front of you for a digital copy. If you're new to our church, text the word guest to the number on your screen so that we can better connect with you and get you information about our church. We also encourage you to take notes and follow along using the Willowbrook app. As we continue to worship and giving, we want to thank you for your generosity. It's because of your giving that we can support all of our ministries, both locally and internationally. Whether you're tuning in online or on campus, we have many ways you can give. You can give on Willowbrook.org or use the Willowbrook app. You can also text the word GIVE to 256-242-5151, or you can mail in your gift or drop your gift off in one of our giving boxes. Your gift truly makes a difference in our community and around the world. Make plans to join us on December 4th for a miracle on Mercy Mount, presented by Willowbrook Choir and Orchestra. It will be an amazing Christmas special packed with drama and worship. Thank you so much for joining us today. For more information about our church, you can visit willowbrook.org or check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Now let's lean in and be open to what God has to say through our pastor's message. Well, good morning, Willowbrook. 
My name is Jared. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Welcome to everyone here in our Huntsville Main Worship Center. Welcome to our Huntsville traditional venue, Madison. You guys just enjoyed some awesome worship led by Derek and the band. It's the campus I usually worship with. Welcome to you. Bradford, so thankful for our Bradford campus and the ministry there. Welcome. And last but not least, if you are streaming anywhere around the world, whether you're home because you're sick with the flu like a lot of people, or you're watching from another country like many of our missionaries we partner with, we're so grateful for you, praying for you, praying that God speaks to you wherever you are at. Hey, I heard a pastor say one time, you have either just gone through a trial, you are going through a trial, or you're about to go through a trial. It's not very encouraging, is it? But it is kind of real life, isn't it? That we all go through difficulty. We all have hard times. And that's really fitting for the sermon series that we are in. We are in a study going verse by verse through the book of 1 Peter, and we have called it Hope in Hard Times. That's one thing that hard times has that is good for us. I know it may not feel good in the moment, but when we're going through hard times, it drives us to consider, well, where's hope in this? And we can always find hope if we're believers in turning to Jesus Christ. That's one good thing that happens during hard times. We have to find hope and we can find it in Christ. But there's another great thing, and it's what we've been studying the last couple of weeks, is that we have an opportunity in hard times to display a holiness. What does the word holy mean? It means set apart. We have an opportunity in the hard times of our life to live a set apart lifestyle for Jesus that points everyone else in the world to him. And people pay attention to that in our lives even more when we're going through hard times than we are going through good times. Everybody expects when you're going through good times for you to say, oh, praise Jesus. So I'm thankful for God for this blessing. But when we're going through tough stuff, People look at how we respond. And when we continue to live holy, set-apart lives to God, even when the blessings aren't pouring in, it makes a massive difference in drawing people to Christ. When we see that they see that we're the real deal, even when things are real tough. So last week, if you're with us, we looked at the idea of being foreigners and exiles in this world. That's 1 Peter 2.11 and living such set-apart lives among the pagans, among people who aren't saved, that they could see that God has made a difference in us. And we looked at three difficult ways to do that. We looked at living a set-apart lifestyle through submission to government, even when we don't like the decisions of government. Peter lived and taught in a time where there was a corrupt Roman government. We looked at submission to masters, and you may recall that uh, the, the type of masters that the Bible talked about were crooked or uh, unnerving or unreasonable masters, and that's our equivalent of bosses today. So submission to government, submission to masters, and then we looked at the idea of suffering and how even our suffering could point people to Christ. And when we do suffer, we're following in the example of Christ, whose own pain and suffering brought about our salvation. So now, today, we're going to continue with the same idea of submitting, and we're going to talk about it in a different context. We're going to talk about submitting when it comes to marriage. So our sermon title is Holy Matrimony. If you don't have it open already, take your copy of the Bible. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We say holy matrimony and marriage because marriage is set apart for God. It is another way that we can live our set apart lives from the rest of the world and throw, show people the way to Christ, the difference maker in us. Let's read together 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them did not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. 
For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Wow. You know, after a week of teaching on submission and suffering, I'm sure I'm glad that we've got a lot easier passage today, right? No, it's not. It's, a, it's actually a really challenging passage. In fact, uh, let's do this. Would you just pray with me right now that God would give us discernment through his Holy Spirit about what we're about to study? Oh, God, I, um, man, I, I'm not alone in recognizing these as being some of the most difficult scriptures uh, about marriage in the Bible. Some parts difficult to understand, some parts difficult to obey, uh, but yet this is your holy word. Every word of it inspired by you, every word of it useful for training in righteousness so that we can be thoroughly equipped disciples of you. So God, we, we pray your Holy Spirit to speak to us. We pray be, we would have open hearts to what your word wants to say to us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start us off with something that may seem obvious to you, but it's not obvious to everybody, and I, I think it's my responsibility to bring this out. Uh, the first thing I want you to write down if you're a note taker, straight from the Word of God here that we see is, number one, as the designer of marriage, God gets to be the definer of marriage. And God defines marriage as being between one man and one woman. You'll see that here in Peter's teaching, he keeps on referring to husbands and wives. Uh, every time I baptize, uh, whether it's here in Madison and uh, in our baptistry or in the lake, uh, I always like to start off the baptism by reminding everybody, even before we dip them in the water and out, just reminding everyone who's being baptized and who's witnessing the baptism that baptism isn't what brings about salvation. I think that's important. The reason I think that's important is because it's consistent throughout all my years as a believer and all my years as a pastor that I encounter people that think the opposite, that think that baptism is what saves people. I hear people say all the time, well, pastor, I, I'm, I was so nervous that if I died, I, I would go to hell because I know I haven't been baptized. Uh, you know, or pastor, I, I know that after today when I'm baptized that I, I can be confident that I'm, that I'm gonna go to heaven. Uh, that shows a, a misunderstanding, that shows an unbiblical thought that baptism is what saves, when the scripture does not teach that. The scripture teaches that ba baptism is an outward symbol of the inward salvation that Christ has already made in us. The scripture teaches that salvation is by grace through faith, not any act and not any works, including the work of, of baptism. Is baptism important? Absolutely. Did Jesus get baptized? Absolutely. We should follow in his example, but it doesn't save us. And I feel the responsibility as a pastor every time I baptize to make sure I say that because there's an unbiblical lie that people have believed when they believe the opposite. I think now, as a pastor, I realize we've come to a time that any time I talk about marriage, I feel like I need to remind everyone who's listening that the Bible's message that God's design for marriage is to be between one man and one woman. And I feel like I have to do that because I feel like so many people have fallen for a lie of the opposite, that we can just make marriage whatever we want that we can redefine what the scripture says about marriage, and that is not what the scripture teaches. Peter talks about marriage between being a husband and wife, so does Jesus Christ. Jesus reaffirmed his design of marriage, actually quoting from the book of Genesis and the very creation of marriage in the first place. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus said this, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. What God has joined together, let no person tear apart. The Bible affirms every time it mentions marriage that it's between a man and a woman. And let me say this with all love, that, er, that the Bible also names the alternative. It names homosexuality to be a sin. And it could not be more clear. 
Now, let me stop and say this. If you are here in this room and you are struggling with God's definition of marriage, or maybe you're struggling with some feelings with regard to your, your sexuality that don't line up with what I, I just said. And, and you're, you're like, Pastor, I can't deny what you just read in, in, in the Bible, but I'm feeling this and my feelings are so powerful. I'm not sure I agree with what you were saying. Uh, can I just stop and say, and say this to you? God loves you. Man, God cares about, about you. Uh, we're not going to back down on what the scripture teaches, but just as, as boldly as God stands for these truths, God also stands for unconditional love and grace and mercy. And I want to challenge you to continue to seek God and realize that in spite of those feelings that you may have or, or may be struggling with, God loves you just as much. I, I'm a, I don't struggle with the same feelings or the same sins, but I'm just in, in need of God's mercy and grace as you. I have my own sins that I struggle with. I have my own thoughts that don't line up with God's word that I struggle with over and over and over, and I'm in constant need uh, of God's grace. And church family, let me remind you of this. If you're a believer here, here in this room, please remember that we can stand on God's truth and not walk around with a judgmental and condemnational spirit. We can do that. It doesn't lessen the truth of which we're, what, which we're standing to be a person of grace and mercy, because that's what Jesus was. Remember, I want you to recall, Jesus spent time in the home of prostitutes. Did he not? He did. I want you to remember that Jesus, when he was, found the woman caught in act of adultery in John chapter 8, what did he tell that woman? He, he was real about her sin. He said, go leave your life of sin. But he also said, woman, no one here condemns you and neither do I. We're not backing down on God's truth. When we call truth, truth. But listen, we balance that with the love that God shows to all people who are struggling with sin. You and I, we have our own sin struggles. Just because they're different with others doesn't mean that we can come with a condemnational, judgmental spirit that pushes people away from the kingdom of God. We need to watch our tone, and we need to be careful we're following the example of Jesus. The scripture is clear that God's the designer of marriage, and because of that, he gets to be the definer of marriage, and he defines marriage as being between one man and one woman, husbands and wives. Not only that, I want you to see in the scripture, God, uh, God's going to have a few words for you today, wives. Uh, I'm not picking on, on women today by having more sermon points uh, for wives. I'm, I'm only doing what the scripture has here. This scripture, the passage we have today, has six verses directed to women, one verse directed to men. Maybe in our next sermon on, on, on marriage, it'll, be, it'll look a little different, but this is what it looks like today. Uh, wives, number two, I want you to see this. Wives, support your husband through biblical submission. Support your husband through biblical submission. Verse 1 says this, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Now, it says in the same way. What's, what's, what's that? That means that we're referring to some, something else, right? There's a comparison here. What's the comparison to? Your version may say likewise. Well, it's a comparison to the other types of submission we discussed last week in our sermon. Submission to government. Submission to earthly masters, which would be uh, our bosses in the case of, that we're living in here in, the, in our century. Uh, Peter says, in the same way you submitted to your government, same way you submitted to your bosses, wives submit to your husbands. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Let's be real and just be honest right now and say that the concept of wives submitting to their husbands has not been really popular in recent years. About as popular as taxes, right? Uh, uh, there's been a lot of controversy regarding this. There's been churches that has been split over this. There's been votes and conventions over this. It's, it's been divisive, to say the least. Uh, I, you know, I think that's for a lot of reasons. And a lot of them are misconceptions and misunderstandings. So I want to point out some things that submission is not today before we talk about what submission is. Uh, and even before I get to that, let me tell you that one reason people get so upset about submission is they forget that the Bible calls for mutual submission and not just wives submitting to their husbands. Ephesians 5.21, uh, Paul writing about marriage, he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So there are times, guys, where husbands are commanded to submit to their wives and put their preferences above their own. But that's not the only misunderstanding. 
Here's a big one right here. Submission doesn't infer superiority. Submission doesn't infer superiority. Now, we know this to be true in other areas of life. Let's take, for example, last week's sermon where we talked about submitting to your employer or your boss. Just because you submit to your boss, does that make you inferior to your boss? No, I don't think so. Uh, Have you ever had a boss that you had more education than him? I bet you have at one time. Have you ever had a boss where you knew more about a particular task than him or her? I bet you have have at one time. Have you ever had a boss where you had more education than him or her? I, I bet you have at one time. Have you ever had a boss where you had more experience than him or her? I bet you have at one time. It didn't make you inferior to, to them. It didn't make them superior to you. It just meant that you had a role within that relationship that was one where you followed their direction. Uh, we can also look at this, the example of Jesus with his parents. Uh, we're, I'm going to tell you in a little bit that the Greek word for submission is the Greek word hupotasso, hupotasso. That's what Peter says that wives should do their husbands. They should hupotasso, submit to their husbands. That, that same Greek word is used in how Jesus submitted to his parents. In Luke chapter 2, verse 51, it says, then he, Jesus, went down to Nazareth with them and submitted to them or was obedient to them. So let me ask you the obvious question. Was Jesus inferior to his parents? Of course not. No, no person who understands Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, is going to say that Jesus is inferior to anyone. Jesus reigns supreme over everyone with authority, including his parents. But yet Jesus submitted to his parents. Why? Because in that relationship, in that role and function, he saw that that was the proper thing to do. Even though he wasn't inferior to them, he still submitted to them. Let's go even further in a biblical example. What about the persons of the Trinity, the Godhead, Three in one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Do we see submission happening within the persons of the Trinity? Absolutely. There's so many times that the scripture talks about Jesus submitting to the will of the Father. Now, was Jesus inferior when he submitted to the will of the Father? Is Jesus less God than God the Father? Uh, You'd have a really hard time uh, making that case biblically, especially when you can look at the book of Colossians and you see that Jesus is named as the full deity in bodily form. Is he not? Jesus is fully God and yet fully human at the same time. So Jesus was absolutely not inferior to God the Father. And yet over and over in the scripture, we see Jesus submitting to the will of God the Father. That's because submission doesn't infer superiority. Secondly, I want you to see this. Submission doesn't negate equality. Now, men and women are certainly created differently, and I I think uh, we can appreciate those differences. We all see those differences. But that doesn't mean that men and women were not created equal by God because they were. We can be different and equal at the same time. And we clearly see that God sees us as one and the same, as human beings. Genesis, or Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Uh, women, I want you to hear this loud and clear today. You are just as valuable as men. Just as valuable. You may be different than men, You may have a different role than men. You may have different gifts than men, but you are just as valuable as men. I'll give you one more uh, thing that submission is not. Submission is not putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. Uh, Just like we talked about last week with submission to government and masters. As soon as the will of government conflicts with the will of God, who am I going to obey as a believer? I'm going to obey God. When God and government conflict, God is always the higher authority. When God and my boss conflict, God is always the higher authority. Same with marriage. Uh, Within your marriage, wives, if your husband leads you to do something or asks you to do something that's against the will of Christ, you absolutely are not to submit to that. 
Uh, remember, Acts 5, 29, we must obey God rather than man. That was spoken in the context of the apostles saying to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, no, we're not going to stop talking about Jesus Christ, even though you've asked us to, because we're obeying God over you because you're asking us to do something that would go against the will of God. I think falling under this would also be an important caveat. If you, if you as a woman are in a marriage relationship where you're being abused in any way, sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused, and that's a little harder to define, but if you're being abused, that clearly your husband is asking you to be subjected to something that is not the will of God. It's complicated, I know it, but, uh, but uh, I would advise you to not give up in your marriage, but I would advise you to get to a place of safety and be separate from your husband for a time where your husband can get help and you can get help so that you can one day return to the marriage relationship that God wants you to to be in. Those are things that submission is not. What is submission then? Well, I told you that Greek word, hupotasso, that's fun to say, but it does have a meaning. What does that mean? Well, hup, it's two words, hupo and tasso coming together. Hupo means to come under or beside and for the purpose of improving something to strengthen it with support. Tasso just means in an appropriate manner or way. So, Submission is not nearly the scary thing that we often make it out to be. A lot of times we make it out to be this thing where a man can say to his wife, yeah, you, you have to do what I say, woman. The Bible says you're to submit to me. You get in the kitchen and you take care of that right now. No, that's not the idea of submission. This idea of submission is a husband and wife coming together as a team. It's the idea of a woman coming alongside her husband and helping to strengthen him in his leadership so that they can be all that God wants them to be as a spiritual team. John, Pastor John Piper, uh, Pastor, I don't agree with everything he says, but he has, he has a lot of great things to say and a lot of deep things to say. He defines submission as this. He says, submission is the calling of a wife to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and to help carry it out or carry it through according to her gifts. That's a great reminder. The submission is going to look different in every marriage. That's, it looks different in my marriage. Uh, there's things that I am not so great at uh, that my wife is a lot better at. And so I ask my wife, I, I, I ask her if she would do things within our marriage to strengthen us and make us a stronger couple because, frankly, I'm not as good at it as she is. You know, and there's other things where she says, well, hey, you're better at this. Could, could, you, could you do this? She asked me to do something. I submit to that and I say, absolutely, I'll, I'll come alongside you and I'll take care of this part of our fam family finances or this part of raising our kids or this part of getting our, our meals ready or all kinds of things so that we can come together and be the spiritual team that God designed husbands and wives to be. That is what biblical submission looks like. It's not something to be scared of. It's something that we can embrace because it's part of God's plan to make us who we need to be as a married couple. All right, we've seen submission. We've seen God's design for marriage. We have another thing for, uh, for you wives, or God does. I want you to write this if you're a note taker. Wives, your godly life can be used to draw your husband to God if he's not a believer. Oh, this is so tough. This is a tough topic, but I'm so glad that the Bible has verses like this to give direction for one of these really difficult circumstances. Uh, Peter is basically addressing the, the tough situation of a woman being a follower of Jesus, a wife being a follower of Jesus, while being married to a man, her husband, who is not. Let's see what he says. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so oh, here comes the context, so that... If any of them did not believe the word, that's the word of God, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Hey, let me be clear. The Bible's model, God's design for marriage, is that two believers would be married to one another. That a, God, a, a man that's a believer would marry a woman that is a believer. And let me stop and say, if you're a single person, uh, let, me, let me remind you that what a believer means. A believer is not someone who just believes that God exists. 
In fact, the Bible basically diminishes the, the value of just believing that God exists by even saying that in the book of James that even the demons believe that God exists and shudder in that knowledge. No, uh, to be a believer, uh, all throughout the New Testament, every, almost every time we see the word belief, it's the Greek word pistis, which means to place one's faith fully in someone or something. So famous verses that you guys, that you would know, like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal, have eternal life. That's the Greek word pistis. It means to place your faith. Who's going to have eternal life? The people that believe just that Jesus Christ existed or that God exists or people who fully place their faith and trust in Jesus? It's the latter, isn't it? Yeah. And that defines what it means to be a believer. So if you're a single person, you want to be married someday. Can I challenge you with this? God calls you in his word to marry a believer. I'm going to show you that in another scripture in a second. A believer is someone who's placed their faith fully in Christ. Don't settle for marrying somebody who just believes that God exists. That's not a life-changing belief. Don't settle for marrying somebody who just believes that going to church is what it means to be a Christian. That in itself is not a life-changing belief. And it's definitely not a biblical belief that the Bible says brings about salvation. No, what you want is a fully devoted follower of Christ, and you want to be that yourself as you're seeking that kind of person to marry. Uh, when we don't have this, when we don't have believers marrying unbelievers, we have what the Bible calls an unequally yoked relationship. You probably heard of this. Do you know, do you know the scripture it comes from? It's 2 Corinthians 6.14. It says this, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Yoked together with unbelievers. What's the Bible talking about there? Well, uh, like any good preacher or teacher, good illustrations always connect with your audience, right? If I, if I told you nothing but stories about being a pastor, that would be not very wise of me, right? Because most, almost everyone out here is not a pastor. So it's, it's kind of unrelatable, maybe occasionally. But the better illustrations would be things that everyone understands. Same with, uh, with Paul, same with Peter, same with Jesus. That's why they used agricultural illustrations because almost all their audience would understand that because they lived in an agricultural economy and, and culture. So Jesus is do, or Paul right here, talking about unequally yoked marriages or relationships is doing just that. Let me show you what a yoke is. Look at the screen here. This is an example of a, what a first century yoke would be similar to. This is a device that would connect two oxen so that that worker in the fields would be able to plow their fields, be able to work their fields further, faster, and more accurately because they would have the combined power of two oxen or cattle that were connected together and working in unison. Now, of course, this completely falls apart. This doesn't work well if you've got one of the oxen who's not pulling their weight, right? If you've got an oxen that's just lazy, if you've got an oxen that, you know, that is trying to pull off to the side instead of, instead of going straight, if, if you've got an oxen that's sick, you know, that, uh, an ox that's sick, it, it's just not going to work well, is it? You know, it, they're going to not go straight in a straight line, or they're going to be slowed down uh, by the, the one ox that's weaker than the other. The same is true the Bible is conveying in our marriages. Uh, if you're bound together in marriage as a believer, with someone who's not a believer, it's going to create all kinds of complications in that relationship, is it not? Sunday morning attendance of church. How about tithing, giving 10% of your income? Now, that's a, that's a tough thing to, con to convince a, an unbelieving spouse to, to do with you. What about the types of media that you're going to let your kids watch? What about re the time that you devote to studying the scriptures? Maybe we could go on and on and on. The family priorities are going to be a conflict and a struggle if one person is passionate about the Lord Jesus and following him in faith because they're a believer and the other person is not. All kinds of conflict there. Now, this doesn't just happen when a believer decides to marry an unbeliever. This also can come about by seemingly no fault of another person. Like, th have you thought this through? I bet you have. Like, uh, this could happen when uh, someone is marrying someone else, and as they're dating, they're, uh, one per they're both people are conveying, yeah, I'm a committed follower of Christ. I'm a committed follower of Christ. And then when they get married, 
you know, they found out that one person was kind of lying, kind of not telling the truth. They, they said those things so that they could get their marriage started in the first place. That unfortunately happens some. Another, another way this happens is that uh, when two people aren't believers get married, and then one person becomes a believer. Uh, either way, we come to this place of being unequally yoked. It's especially hard for a believing wife or an unbelieving husband because God has designed husbands to do what? Be the spiritual leaders of the home. And when that leadership is not provided, it messes up a lot of what God's plan affords uh, when it's happening the correct way. So all that to say, what should a believing wife do in this circumstance if she has an unbelieving husband? Should she leave him? Should she divorce him and start over with a believing husband? No, the Bible says no. The Bible says that she should stay. And the Bible tells why. It says that she should stay for the purpose of spiritual influence. Look at it again. Wives in the same way, submit to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word of God, they may be won over by, or won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Won over. What are we talking about? We're talking about their husband seeing the influence of them a living for the Lord. Remember, influence comes through interaction. Lots of interaction between husbands and wives, or at least there should be in most marriages. That husband who's not a believer seeing the behavior of their wife and being won over by the purpose that they have in their life, the joy they have because of, because of Jesus Christ. Does it always happen? Hmm, not always. Does, does it happen fast? Very seldom. But the scripture conveys that it is possible, and I've seen it many times, and I bet you have as well. How does that best happen? How can a, a wife best have influence? Here's a thought for you. Influence best happens when you consistently show the change God has made in you without trying to play God and forcibly change the other person. Mm. That's really hard though, isn't it? You know? Because a lot of times uh, the, the frustration is building and building and building. And I cannot begin to tell you uh, the pain of having an unbelieving spouse. Uh, uh, I had a person just last week after, the last, after our sermon last week come up in, in tears talking about how hard this is. I, I can't fully understand it, but I, I, can, I can have some empathy for how hard it is. Because you so desperately want your husband to know the Lord. You so desperately want to experience being led spiritually like God's design is. And you're not experiencing that. It's an unmet expectation that brings a lot of grief to you. And it can be so tempting to try to forcibly change that man. Try to, try to turn him into a believer. Maybe even do some manipulation of, hey, you know what? If you don't come to church, I'm not doing this at home anymore. If you don't read the Bible with me, I'm not going to do this in this part of the house. It, it, all, all these things can be so tempting, and so it can be so tempting to become bitter. And the scripture says that's not what wins a husband over. What wins a husband over is when the behavior of their wife is demonstrated even without words. Doesn't mean you can't talk about Jesus. Doesn't mean you can't talk about church. It just means what people often say, that your actions of following Jesus are going to speak much louder than those words. And your consistent example will be noticed by your husband. All right, well, uh, let's move on to uh, another challenging, but, uh, but, uh, but yet absolutely scriptural thing for, for wives. Number four, I want you to write this down. Wives, make sure you value most the beauty God values most. Make sure you value most the beauty God values most. Look at verses three and four. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold and jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. You know, I think we've had enough uh, scripture here for wives just hearing from a man's perspective. That often happens when you're in sermons, right? But I, I want to have a, d a different type of opportunity right now. I want to invite up uh, not only to speak about this, but some of the things we've already talked about. I want to invite up my wife to come and share the stage, uh, the platform with me, and to address all the wives and women in the room uh, not only as my wife, but also as the women's minister of Willowbrook. So would you welcome to the platform my wife, your women's minister, Bobby Ann Allen. All right. 
Well, thank you, love. Uh, hey, I, I, I'm going to let you start us off with this. I've, I've done it the last two services, but um, I know we're both passionate about conveying to people that uh, even though pastors have different jobs, we don't have different marriages. Can you speak to that for a second before we dive in? Uh, yeah, um, okay. Um, yeah, basically, uh, we have a lot of the same struggles a lot of marriages do. Um, we argue about a lot of the same things, sex, finances, who's going to do what. We, um, we have those real life struggles just like any marriage does. So we are not, we may have different jobs, but we're just Jared and Bobby Ann who put our pants on one leg at a time, yeah, <laughs> just like you do. We're just, we're normal. That's what I want, I want you to know before we start talking about, uh, well, not uh, about really marriage. normal. Okay, there you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, hey, let's, before we talk about beauty, uh, the point we're in right now, let's back up just a little bit, because you've heard us in the last two services and just now. We've, we've broken down the biblical idea of submission of wives to their husbands. What, what advice would you give to some wives who, even after hearing that, would say, how I still, I still don't like it. I'm still struggling with that. How, how, how can they embrace that and be obedient to that? Yeah, I think, and I can't speak for everybody, but I think sometimes we really struggle, um, and women struggle with the idea of submission because we have equated it with value. And sometimes we've done that to ourselves. We have um, misunderstood some of the scriptures and, and taken it to mean that we are valued less than, than the men in our lives or, or our husbands. And as such, um, there's something inside us that just fights against it. And as it should, because um, our value does not come from our gender. Our value comes from the price that God was willing to pay through his son for our salvation. That's right. And that's not specific to gender. And so that's, first of all, I think that, that that's part of it. But then some of us have had words spoken over us that have made us feel less valuable. And that, that does, that almost triggers something in us that, that wants to fight against that. And it is where I would encourage us to, I heard, I heard a pastor say just a, a couple weeks ago, um, he was speaking to a room of women and he said this, he said, women, you are not a second string. And I thought, hmm, you need to know that I, I don't like to watch Saturday football. That's not something I enjoy very much. I do. Um, yeah. Yes, Jared does. Yeah. Um, but our son Kai has recently started playing football, and that means I'm an expert on football now. Um, I know all about football. In fact, if you saw me uh, on the sidelines, I, I'm that weird mom that sometimes runs um, because I just get excited. Um, but I, I was thinking about this, this pastor, and what he said is that we're not second string, and it <laughs> reminded me of Kai playing football. And you know what? Um, if everybody played quarterback, there wouldn't be a wide receiver to catch the ball. And that's how it is with submission. And I think that we need to receive that, is that if we're all trying to play the same position, it just doesn't work. It, it doesn't work like it should work. Mm -hmm. And God has given us God-ordained, God-assigned positions yeah. so that we can be a team, and ultimately, marriage is designed that we would bring the most glory to God, not, not that we would receive the most comfort or that our preferences would be met, but that God would receive the most glory, mm. and that happens as we embrace that, hey, every position is valuable, and we need them all to make this thing work. No, it's true. It's so true. Uh, now, with, with regard to influence, I know part of the women, being a women's ministry leader is women come to you with their frustrations and their hurts, and which is great because it shows that they believe that you and our women's ministry leaders are a safe place to come to. And, and a lot of times the, what you hear is the pain and the hurt of a home that isn't living up to what God's design is. Uh, with regard to a woman having influence over her or with her unsaved husband, do you have any practical tips? You know, I think it's such a balance. Like, because you want to speak up so that you're bringing Jesus to the forefront, but you also don't want to make your husband feel like a project, like you're just just trying to convert him all the time. Uh, how, what, what would do you have any wisdom for women in that area? Yeah, I, and I would say I want to be careful to say that that I this is not 
something that I fully understand. I don't walk this. Mm -hmm. But what I do walk, what I do understand is deep longing. A deep longing in my heart for something. And, and that is often the case for someone who is in this position. There is a deep longing in your heart that your husband would know the Lord, that he would lead your home. And scripture tells us that the deep longings of our heart is exactly where Jesus wants to meet you. Right. In fact, in Psalm 130, it, uh, verse 1, it says, out of the depths the depths of our heart, I call to you, Lord, that Jesus wants to meet you in your innermost being, those places where you long the most. And some of us haven't met Jesus there. You haven't invited him into those places, sometimes because you want to fix it. You, you want to take control of the situation and not trust it to God. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's in those times that when we feel out of control, I mean, I've got my own things I'm praying for right now, deep longings that, that I feel like I've done everything I can do and I'm still waiting. Yep. And that sometimes that's where a passive aggressive word comes out. It's evidence of fear and, 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 and a lack of control, that words that create not a safe space for someone to come into relationship with Jesus. But I would encourage you, first of all, if, if you're in this, if you're in the time of waiting, surround yourself with, with people who love the Lord who people who are, are walking with the Lord to encourage you because when you're waiting, it can become so discouraging. It becomes exhausting sometimes. Put yourself around those people and then spend time with Jesus. Let the fruit of his spirit become evident through you because sometimes when we read scriptures like this, we feel this, this oh, well, I've just got to grit and bear and let's do this and well, that doesn't look like something someone would want to join in on. That's right. But when you really acknowledge that God is God and his spirit is at work in you, the fruit of, those, of his spirit will come out of you. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And that's hard to resist. Mm. But many times we're not seeking that. We're seeking our agenda and our way instead of letting God do the work he wants to do in us for All that. All right, hey, thank you for that wisdom. All right, back to our sermon point here that we just introduced, the idea of inward beauty versus outward beauty. So the scripture says, you know, don't let your beauty come from outward adornment, like hairstyles and gold jewelry and fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self. Uh, this has got to be a struggle for, for women, I, I would think. I'm not going to pretend I understand what it would be like to be a woman, but it seems like the world is absolutely pushing outer beauty, outer beauty, outer beauty as the most important thing. Uh, how can a woman value inner beauty, and what does that look like? Yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. In fact, if you, if you go to Publix and you stand in the line and look at the magazines, it, there, there's a lot more magazines emphasizing women's beauty than there is men's outer appearance. Um, they're just there. It's why there's Instagram filters, um, we value, our culture emphasizes outward beauty, and it's very easy for us to get caught up in that. The scripture is not telling us that, oh, that we should be homely. That is not what it's telling us. It's, it's asking the question, where are you investing? Where are you valuing? And we can answer that question, I think, for ourselves. Um, you always know what you value by where you're putting your time and where you're putting your money. If you're spending more time and money on your appearance than you are letting the, mm. the Holy Spirit do a work in you, then you're, you value outer appearance more than you mm. value inner beauty. And, and this, is, this is actually a male or female. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Sure. That outward appearance can mask an ugly heart. And every single one of us has an ugly heart apart from Jesus's salvation, his righteousness that he puts on us. And this is that, that investment. Are you investing the time to, to meet with Jesus, to confess your sins, to, to align your heart with his? Because there's a beauty that comes out of that that cannot be store-bought. And, and I think that is so much. We, we recognize that 
It is. It is a pressure. It, it is something that we hear and, and see, and it comes at us from so many directions. Um, but I let the whole, we can stand out from the world by a beauty that comes from the inside and not just outwardly. Amen. I remember one thing you used to say is if you want to attract a prince, you have to be a princess. And if you, if you're, uh, if you want to attract a godly man to be your husband, uh, that godly man is going to be looking for a godly woman. He, 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 he may be attracted to you outwardly, but he is going to be looking for the insides to match uh, the outsides for well, you to have a heart. The people for the Lord. that we live with that are the closest to us, they know. They, they, yeah. may, they know you may look good on the outside, but they're not attracted to something that if, if it's just harsh and mean and, mm. and it's not the same. That's true. All right. Would you thank Bobby Ann with me and, and the wisdom for our women? I'm going to close out with where Peter closes out with uh, a point for our men. We may only get one of the seven verses this time, men, but it's a tough one. It's a big one. Um, there's a phrase that Peter attaches to how we treat our wives that I've never seen anywhere else in the scripture regarding uh, marriage. Look, uh, point number five here. Husbands, treating your wife right is part of being in a right relationship with God. Where do we see that? Verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you the gracious gift of life. Here, here's that. Here's the, the vertical connecting with the horizontal. So that nothing will hinder your prayers. That's powerful, isn't it? That basically tells me that if, if I'm trying to treat my wife in a way that's unbiblical, if I'm trying to treat my wife, my wife wrong, there's no way I'm going to be in a right relationship with God. Impossible. It's going to hinder my relationship with God if I'm not willing to honor my wife in the way that Christ has called me to. Now, hey, I'll address it. Uh, but, um, the, uh, the phrase weaker partner or weaker vessel uh, this always gets all the attention. There's a lot of questions regarding this because it sounds uh, at, you know, at first glance as, as condemning uh, of women that they're weaker than, than men. Scholars debate what this phrase means. Uh, most scholars land on, on, on something that is somewhat understandable. Most scholars land on the fact that Peter is probably talking about the vessel being the physical body. There's a lot of, of biblical language in the New Testament where the vessel is the human body. And so if he's doing that, that would make sense because in generalities and stereotypes, uh, the, the, the body of a wife, the body of a female, may not be as strong as that of a man. Of course, that is just a stereotype. That is just something that's generally true. I'm sure I've met some women that could absolutely beat me up. Uh, the, some women that are really, really strong. But, um, but that, that's not the point of the passage anyway. Um, and the clear message of Scripture is that men, are, men and women are equal in God's sight and that each person, not each man and woman, each person brings different strengths and, and weaknesses to the relationship. The clear emphasis here in verse 7 is the command given to husbands to be considerate of their wives and how they treat them. Considerate. What does that mean? Well, it means to be thoughtful. Uh, I'm, my father-in-law is here in the room today visiting our family. He's, he's known in our family for repeating the phrase, it takes a thought to be thoughtful. Uh, that's good. And it's, it, takes, it takes thoughtfulness. It takes a thought. It takes consideration for you 